This episode of the AI Daily Deep Dive podcast was researched entirely by the new AI model, Gemini Deep Research, and is fully AI generated. Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Today, we're digging into, well, a pretty provocative question. It's everywhere right now. Will these new video AI tools, the ones really making waves, actually kill Hollywood? It's definitely a dramatic headline, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, that's exactly the title of the single source we're focusing on today. Mm. This whole deep dive comes from just one essay, Will Video AI Tools Kill Hollywood? Right. So our mission here is to basically unpack that essay for you, pull out the key insights, the facts, what the essay argues is really going on so you can get a clear picture. Exactly. Cut through the noise. And, you know, the title frames it as this, like, epic battle. AI versus Hollywood, yeah. But the essay itself pretty quickly suggests maybe killing isn't quite the right verb. It talks more about um, a massive transformation, a disruption, really. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into that. The essay starts by talking about these recent developments like Google's VO3 and Flow, and calls them a technological earthquake for Hollywood. Strong words. Very strong. And it really stresses how fast this happened. I mean, think back just a couple of years, 2022, 2023. The essay points out AI video was, well, pretty basic then. Right. Things like Runway Gen 1, Pika Labs, mm -hmm. short clips, often kind of glitchy. Exactly. Glitchy, inconsistent, interesting, maybe, but not really usable for much serious work. Then, bam. The essay says 2024 was this significant inflection point. Uh, so that's when Sora came out and the newer runway early VO. Precisely. And the quality just jumped. The essay mentions longer scenes, coherent scenes, getting close to 20 seconds, hitting 1080p, and crucially better understanding of like physics and how things should move. Okay, but then the really big shift, according to this essay, was mid-2025 with Google's VO3 at their big conference. Yeah, the essay flags that as a paradigm shift. Oh. It describes VEO3 as state of the art. Exceptional prompt following, stunning cinematic outputs, it says. A much more sophisticated grasp of realism. And length, too, right? It mentions clips up to 60 seconds. Yeah. Aiming for 4K, even. That's what the announcement claimed, yeah. Though the essay notes uh, initial previews might have been shorter, like eight seconds for some folks. But uh, the absolute key differentiator it highlights, native audio generation. Whoa, okay. So it makes video and the sound, dialogue, effects, music. All together, yeah. which, you know, just bypasses a whole trunk of work right there. The essay also talks about multimodal prompting text, images, sketches as input. And keeping characters consistent. That's always been a hurdle. A big one. So right. consistent characters, consistent scenes, and it's not just the VEO3 model on its own. The essay discusses the Flow platform. Right, the AI filmmaking tool built by and for creatives. Exactly. Integrating VEO3, image in for images, Gemini for language stuff. It apparently has tools like a scene builder, camera controls, asset management, Management, even something called Flow TV. And it's not free, is it? The essay mentions a subscription, like Google AI Ultra, around $249 a month. Yeah, suggesting it's definitely aimed at professionals, serious creators. So the essay's point is, the shockwave isn't just about what VU3 can do now. No, it's the speed, the pace of improvement we just saw. It makes even more powerful tools seem, as the essay puts it, imminent. That 60-second 4K video with audio, it sees that as a near-term inevitability. Okay, so pulling that together, native audio makes AI video instantly more useful. And platforms like Flow lower the barrier to entry. Right, potentially opening things up for new storytellers outside the traditional system. That alone is a huge potential shift. So the essay looks ahead too, right? Yeah. The next three years or so, 2025 to 2028, what does it predict? Yeah, it projects even a faster acceleration. We're talking uh, consistent photorealism becoming the standard. 4K is normal, 8K starts appearing. And longer coherence, beyond 60 seconds. Eventually minutes, yeah. yeah. Keeping characters, environments consistent across multiple shots. And better physics simulation, making things look totally natural. What about control? Does the essay see that getting better? Dramatically better. More intuitive directorial controls, camera, lenses, depth of field, maybe even setting the emotional tone. It mentions director-level 3D control, using depth maps, understanding the 3D space. So you could change things and see the result almost instantly. That's the idea. Near real-time synthesis. And multimodality gets bigger using video, audio, motion capture, sketches, whatever, as input. There was that IDC prediction the essay mentioned. 80% of models multimodal by 2020. Foundational models, yeah. And AI agents, sort of like digital teammates, integrating into workflows. Plus, wider accessibility, easier interfaces, maybe costs coming down for some tiers, even if the top stuff stays premium. 
The essay also mentions specialized models, like AI trained for specific genres. Exactly. Fine-tuned for horror or comedy, or like the example it gives, Skyreel's V1 for human drama. And AI starting to understand narrative itself, character arcs, emotional beats, themes, that's a whole other level. And it goes beyond just linear film, doesn't it? The VRR angle. Right. That's where the 3D scene understanding comes in. Instead of just making a video of a scene, the AI could construct the dynamic scene itself. You, the viewer, could move around, interact. Blurring the lines between film, gaming, XR. Totally. And the essay even floats this idea of AI auteurs or AI style engines. Creators choosing AI tools based on their built-in aesthetic, like collaborating with an AI that has its own style. Which leads to the big question. How does this change people's jobs? Well, the essay argues human expertise shifts. Less manual work, more strategic direction. Prompt engineering, curation, making judgments. So craft changes. Mm. A director's skill becomes how well they communicate their vision to the AI. And guide it. Refine it. It means new skills, definitely. A different way of thinking about making things. Okay, so this brings us right back to the core question. Hollywood. Transformation or obsolescence? Okay. The essay presents both sides, right? Opportunities and threats. Absolutely. On the opportunity side, for producers especially, it's democratization and massive cost reduction, lowering those huge financial and technical hurdles. Didn't it mention Jeff Katzenberg predicting like a 90% cost cut for animation? It did. And Sony exploring AI for savings. The theoretical $200 million blockbuster costing maybe $40 million. And a projection of the AI film market hitting $14 billion by 2033. Huge numbers. And it streamlines everything. Pre-production, production, post. Across the board, according to the essay. Script analysis, storyboards, animatics in pre-pro, AI-assisted cinematography, virtual sets during production, but post-production sees huge benefits. Automating VFX tasks like rotoscoping, editing, color, sound, even ADR. All of it. The essay talks about potentially saving weeks, even months, from schedules, plus creative boosts. Rapid prototyping, exploring styles, generating B-roll fast, new revenue streams too, like easy localization with AI dubbing, personalized content. Okay, but then the threats. The essay doesn't downplay those. Job displacement is number one. It calls it a primary concern. Actors facing digital doubles or synthetic performers, VFX artists seeing tasks automated, writers potentially dealing with AI-generated scripts, other crew members too. And the fear that human creativity gets devalued that the work becomes less fulfilling. Or less well-paid. And quality concerns too, relying too much on AI, getting generic, biased, maybe emotionally flat content. How's Hollywood actually responding, according to the essay, moving beyond just tests? Yeah, it mentions studios like Amazon, MGM, Lionsgate implementing AI, but focusing on making good content that happens to leverage AI. So tool focus, not AI for AI's sake. And the union deals from 2023 are key here. SAG AFTRA, WGA, DGA. Crucial first steps, the essay argues. Setting rules for consent and pay for digital replicas, putting guardrails on AI writing. The DGA emphasizing AI as a tool to help directors not replace them. But these deals are temporary, right? And don't cover everything. Exactly. SAG AFTRA is 36 months, and they don't really address fully synthetic performers, yet ones with no human original. That's still a gray area. Then there's the whole ethical minefield, copyright especially. A huge unresolved issue the essay highlights. Training AI on copyrighted stuff is that legal. Can AI output even be copyrighted if there's not enough human input? It mentions clean models trained on licensed data, like from Google or Adobe. As one response, yeah. Which could lead to two tracks, safe licensed AI content and riskier stuff from open source models, plus worries about deep fakes, bias, diluting human expression. It mentions Google's synthiide watermark as one attempt at a solution. There's that interesting side effect the essay mentioned about the union deals. Protecting human replicas might actually make synthetic actors cheaper. Yeah, an unintended consequence, perhaps. If you have clear rules and costs for using a human actor's likeness, maybe becomes more appealing purely financially for some productions to just create an AI performer from scratch, leading to purely digital AI stars. So the essay sees adaptation happening differently. Big studios using AI for efficiency, indies for experimentation. Essentially, yeah, a bifurcation. It underlines that AI impacts almost every stage based on a table it includes summarizing the changes. Okay, so AI isn't just changing how films are made, but also enabling totally new types of content, a new palette. That's the argument. First up, hyper-personalized video. 
tailoring content right down to you, the individual. Beyond just better targeted ads. Oh, way beyond. Think tailored education, news reports just for you, product demos focused on your interests, even entertainment snippets for super niche tastes. Wow. And then interactive stuff. Right. Dynamic storytelling. You influence the plot, explore VRR environments generated by AI, AI creating whole worlds, NPCs, virtual actors that respond to you. And synthetic media, AI influencers, yeah. news anchors. Yeah. Avatars, synthetic actors, obvious cost benefits, branding control, but huge questions about authenticity, deception if it's not transparent, plus AI for rapid B-roll, concept art, music, sound becoming standard tools. It also mentions rapid prototyping getting a boost. Big time. Testing ideas, styles, story variations super quickly before committing big budgets. It mentions a couple of examples like Synthetic Summer or Optimax 5000, but stresses, you know, significant human creativity was still key there. What about generative storytelling engines? That sounds pretty wild. It is. The idea is the product isn't the film. It's the AI system that generates unique story variations based on user input or data. Imagine infinite versions of a story. Raises huge IP questions. Does all this personalization lead to disposable media? The essay called it ephemeral media. That's the concern raised. If it's so tailored, does it lose cultural weight? Do we lose those shared movie moments everyone talks about? And AI avatars make us question what's real online. Right? Yeah, definitely. Trust becomes harder. The essay argues we need better digital literacy, better verification than just watermarks. Okay, so how does this change things for us, the audience, you, the listener? Well, hyper-personalization, you already see it with Netflix, TikTok recommendations, right? The essay suggests this goes further, platforms generating or tweaking videos in real time just for your mood or interest. Sounds engaging, mm -hmm. but also potentially isolating. Those filter bubbles or generative bubbles the essay mentioned. Exactly. Less shared experience, more fragmentation. But audiences are getting savvy, the essay notes. Surveys show people are a bit wary of fully AI-made films or music. There's a preference for human authenticity. So people want transparency to know if AI was used. Overwhelmingly, according to the essay, like 61% think companies should disclose it. And there could be backlash 36% less likely to buy from brands using AI and ads without saying so. Trust is key. Which leads to that authenticity paradox idea. As AI gets perfect, human flaws become valuable. Potentially, yeah. Certified human made might become a selling point, a premium feature almost. And maybe we just get overwhelmed. Content fatigue. That's a real possibility the essay raises. A flood of easy to make, maybe mediocre AI content. Audiences might get more selective, seek out quality, or value things AI can't easily replicate, like live events. So we need more than just watermarks, yeah. better labeling. Granular info, maybe blockchain for provenance. Building trust in this new landscape is crucial, the essay suggests. Okay, so wrapping it all up. What's the future content landscape look like, according to this essay? Mass appeal or infinite niches? It explores both. Fragmentation seems likely with all the personalization micro niches, fewer shared hits, maybe hollowing out the middle ground. Well, consolidation is also possible. If AI makes high quality stuff cheaper, maybe we get new kinds of mass entertainment. What about blockbusters? Can they survive? The essay poses that question. Maybe AI optimizes them for global appeal, making them more formulaic but successful. Or maybe the blockbuster becomes a framework, a core world, where AI spins out personalized stories for fans. And new money models are coming. Subscriptions selling AI assets. For sure. But the essay keeps coming back to the copyright problem. IP uncertainty makes big AI-only projects risky, complicating how you make money from them. So hybrid models seem most likely. Human core, AI assistance. That's where the essay seems to land. Mass stories with personal touches, AI helping serve niche audiences better. It suggests sustainability depends on sorting out the legal stuff and figuring out how much consumers value AI-touched content. Hybrid approaches seem the safest bet for now. So back to the big question, does AI kill Hollywood? The essay's answer seems to be, no, not really kill. Not extinguish it, no, but compel a massive fundamental transformation. That's the key takeaway. AI isn't the destroyer, but an augmenter an automator, an enabler of new things. Right. And the essay concludes the most likely future is this deeply symbiotic relationship. Humans provide the vision, the emotion, the judgment. And AI provides the speed, the efficiency, the tools for broader expression. The art is in the collaboration. Exactly. Which leads to the essay's final thought for you, the listener, to mull over. It says the real question isn't humans versus AI. It's how will humans choose to create, to collaborate, to tell stories with AI. And why that matters to you. 
because those choices shape everything. The stories you see, the jobs people have, maybe even our shared culture itself. Something to think about.